Okay, this is what we started talking in the last class. Very simple concept, very interesting idea, but very useful concept as well. Okay, so in the class before last, we looked at passive sign convention, KCL and KVL. Okay, KCL and KVL using dependent sources. Okay, in the last class, we started looking at series and parallel simplification. In addition to series and parallel simplification, we looked at something else. What was the other topic that we looked at in the last class? Somewhat related to series and parallel. But, uh, uh, what wasn't it current and uh, voltage dividing? Division, yes. Okay, so we keep adding to this list. Okay, so if you want to, if you want to really um, do something that makes you feel good at the end of the course, this is what I'd say: make a list of all the techniques that we went over and all the techniques that you found um, that you can apply. Um, you know, in your in your tool set. That way, at the end of the course, it gives you a warm sense of satisfaction to know all the um, different techniques that you pick up in just a matter of six weeks. Some of these you're already familiar with, okay? Now, we looked at two kinds of connections, series and parallel, series and parallel connections. Um, series connection is when the current is the same, the same current through each device that's highlighted in purple here. And then um, when, Elements are connected in parallel. They have the same voltage across them, okay? And by applying this guy, by applying that concept, we looked at the equivalent resistance. When a bunch of resistors are connected in series, I have how many? Seven resistances connected in series. All of this can be replaced with just one equivalent resistance, R equivalent. The value of this equivalent resistance is the sum of all the resistances, all the seven resistances. Right? That's what we discussed. This is in series. Okay. When in series, the logic that I apply to arrive at this equivalent resistance is that the current flowing through this loop is the same. There's only one current flowing through all the resistances. Then you apply KVL, then you get the result that shows the equivalent resistance. The equivalent resistance is the sum of all the individual resistances in series. Okay, that's the result we arrive at for series combination. Similarly, when it comes to parallel, and then, of course, before we went on to parallel, I showed you a quick sanity check. If you have a bunch of different resistances in series, okay, you have a set of resistors in series, the equivalent resistance is always larger than the largest resistance. That's a quick sanity check. Okay, good. So that's about series resistances. And then we went on to talking about resistors in parallel. Okay, resistances in parallel are characterized by the idea that the voltage applied or the voltage between each of those terminals, okay, each of those resistances, the voltage across R1 is the same as the voltage across R2, is exactly the same across voltage across R3, so on and so forth. Okay, the voltage is constant across all the resistances in parallel. And using that, we arrived. I did not show you the exact calculation, but I mentioned that the equivalent resistance, when you have a bunch of resistances in parallel, it follows the following rule. One over R equivalent is one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. If there are three resistances in parallel, Okay, that's something we discussed in the last class. Okay. 
And then we arrived at that solution by looking at the KCL, KCL at node A. Okay, KCL at node A. We applied and then we found out that the different currents that are branching through R1, R2, and R3, they should add up to IS. Okay, these different currents, one, two, three, these three currents and four. These four currents, when you add them up, they should equal the current coming from the voltage source. That's exactly the idea here. The current supplied by the source is equals to the, oops, let me do it this way. The current supplied by the source, which is this guy, okay, that's the IS over here, that should exactly equal all the current that is going through the different resistances, okay? And by applying this KCL at node A, we arrived at the equivalent resistance, okay? The equivalent resistance for four resistances in parallel. When you connect four resistances in parallel, okay? Now, I showed you a quick sanity check as well in the last class, you don't have to actually do the math. When you have a bunch of resistors, okay? 3.14, 13.35, 18.96, 1.732, okay? A quick and sanity check to see if your final answer, let's say you got an answer that says 0 0.998. Well, that could be correct because the equivalent resistance is smaller than the smallest resistance. The smallest resistance is 1.732, okay? And the result that I got for parallel combination is 0.998. So it could be that uh, I'm on the right track here, okay? But if in, other, if, if in the other hand, you see an R equivalent, equals to 1.897 ohms. Then you know right away, because this cannot be true, the equivalent resistance has to be greater than the smallest resistance, okay? So the idea is that it's simply a sanity check that you can use, okay? Now, So that's the idea of parallel resistances. When you have two resistances in parallel, okay, the equivalent resistance is the product of those two resistances by the sum, okay? Product of those resistances over the sum. Okay, that's the equivalent resistance. And then we went on to solving some problems, all right? We went on to solving some problems, okay? And they're color-coded here. Okay, let's see. We solved one problem before we went on to voltage and current divider, okay? So here is the deal. Let me go back to the syllabus really quickly, okay? Where is my syllabus? The syllabus says we are supposed to, let's say, we are supposed to cover chapter three, voltage and current divider, voltage and current division in today's class, okay? And we covered that fortunately in the last class itself. So I don't intend to go far beyond what we are scheduled to do, okay? So tomorrow I'll come back and maybe I'll start chapter five, four today. I don't know, or uh, tomorrow, but uh, I don't want to, wander way far um, away from our schedule, okay? So I intend to spend some more time on voltage and current division. If we are done sooner than um, the class on time, we are done, you, you, you know, you're free to go. Especially the reason is for the exam. When you look at the exam, it's only chapters one, two, and three. So I don't want to start chapter four um, 
and spend a whole lot of, I will start chapter four before your exam, but I will just give you an introduction. I don't want to spend a lot of time distracting you from um, chapters one, two, and three. Okay, so I'll introduce chapter four in today's class or the next class, but only likely. Okay. All right. So that's my um, that's my agenda for today. So we'll spend some more time on voltage and current division, and I'll give you another technique. Okay, using MATLAB when you have a bunch of different equations, when you have a system of simultaneous linear equations. How are you going to how are you going to solve them? Okay, that's the that's the tool I'm going to give you using MATLAB. Okay. So, but let's see. Let's uh, talk about the idea of voltage division. Okay, voltage division happens in. Uh, let me erase all of this. Okay, voltage division happens in series. Okay, when you have two or more resistors in series, that's where your voltage division comes into play. Okay. Now, if you want to find the value of, uh, so the total voltage Vs that is supplied by the voltage source should equal the voltage that is dropped in R1 and the voltage that is dropped in R2. That's the basic idea of KVL, right? So if you write the KVL loop equation, you'll get that minus Vs plus V1 plus V2 is zero which turns out to be the exact same thing. Okay, the voltage supplied by the voltage source is equals to the voltage drop, okay, drop in resistors supplied by the voltage source. Okay, so it's the manifestation of KVL. Okay, so the idea is this voltage Vs is divided between V1 resistor and V2 R2 resistor. Did I do that? Okay, let's see. V1 resistor and V2 resistor. Okay, the total applied voltage, which is this guy, the voltage that is supplied by the voltage source is divided between R1 and V2, and hence the name voltage divider circuit, voltage division circuit, okay? And then we, in the last class, I gave you an expression for the value of V1, okay? V1 is directly proportional to the value of resistance R1, over R1 plus R2 times Vs, okay? V2 is R2 by R1 plus R2 times Vs, okay? Is there a way to remember this um, idea? How many formulas can you remember? Is, if there is, if only there is an intuitive way to remember this expression for voltage division, that would make my life easy, right? So I want you to take a minute to look at these expressions for V1 and V2. So let me clean them up. Let me reduce the pigmentation here. Okay. Think about how you can easily remember this V1 or, or without having to memorize these formulas. Okay, because you certainly will come across a million formulas in this class, and it's easier if only you intuitively look at these equations. You look at these equations and make try to make some physical sense out of these uh, components and variables here. So the question again is, look at this expression for V1. Can you explain this equation in terms of some known phenomenon? Do you mean like the summation notation? 
Can, can you say that again? Um, all right. Like the summation notation, where we, uh, Vj is equal to Rj over Vs, or sorry, times Vs over our equivalent. Sure, sure. So let me go back to the summation. Um, Vj equals to um, Rj over our equivalent, which is um, sum of, uh, let, let's just say this is R equivalent times Vs, right? That's what you would say. Yeah. Where yeah. R equivalent, R equivalent is the summation over all the resistances, okay? In parallel, in, in series. Sure, that is correct. That's one, um, that's one explanation for it. Can we can we glean more insights? That's correct. That's a good beginning step. Can we glean more insights? Specifically, I want you to look at this. I'll give you a hint. See if you can think in terms of Ohm's law. Because that's something we know very well, right? Ohm's law, V is I times R. Okay, so if we can break this expression down and remember it in terms of the Ohm's law, then I would not have to really remember it. It's, it's um, naturally assimilated into my knowledge, knowledge, um, knowledge pool. Um, to compare it to Ohm's law, I know that um, Vs over R1 plus R2, that would be the source current. Thank you. Vs over R1 plus R2. So let me do this. Vs over R1 plus R2. That's the current that's flowing through each of these resistors, right? What's the current flowing through resistance R1? That's Vs over the total resistance, R1 plus R2. That is I, okay? So that guy is I, okay? And this guy is R, okay? So this equation, the equation that um, when I say, when I say voltage division circuit, it really, is manifestation of Ohm's law, I times R, okay? R is R1, I is the current flowing through the resistance, which is Vs over R1 plus R2. So this guy is I, this guy is R1, should give you V1, okay? So that's simply the idea. The exact same thing here, okay? I does not change. Okay, it's still the exact same thing. I does not change because in series, it's the same current that's flowing, okay? So I is still Vs over R1 plus R2. So earlier I had this resistance R1. Now, if I want to find the voltage dropped across resistance R2, it's R2 times I2, IR, Ohm's law, okay? So, um, Voltage division is really a manifestation of Ohm's law. Okay, questions please. Okay. Let's see, let's see if I can show you some um, example problems here that make it uh, second nature almost to you. That will be my effort. Okay, I'll show you some really, really easy numbers to remember. Let's say I have two resistors, resistors here in series. Okay, I have two resistors in series and I'm applying some voltage. Okay, let's try this to be, okay, two resistors in series. And uh, the voltage I'm applying is 10 volts. 
And the resistances are two ohms and eight ohms. Okay. Why don't you find the, this is called R1. This is R2. Okay. Why don't you find the value of R V1 and V2? Okay, the voltage dropped across V1. V2. Okay, so take a couple of minutes to solve that. I'll give you a spoiler alert. That should be eight volts, and this should be two volts. Okay, so it's the idea is the smaller resistance. Oops. The other way around. This should be two volts. This should be eight volts. Okay, the voltage dropped V1 should be two volts, V2 should be eight volts, okay? The smaller resistance in series drops a small voltage. The larger resistance drops a large voltage. Let's see if this is true or not, okay? What's the, first let's find by, let's start by looking at the total current flowing in here. What's the total current flowing in here? The total current flowing in here is the voltage applied by the total resistance. one amp here, that's a large, large current. That's a really large current. Okay. One amp here, um, especially for these resistance values, okay? Now, if you want to find the value of V1, V1 is R1 times Is, all right? So that's going to be two ohms times one amp here, which is two volts. And you do the exact same thing for V2. R2 times Is, which is eight ohms times one ampere, which is going to be eight volts, okay? So the idea is simple. The voltage dropped by a resistance in series is proportional to its resistance value. So the idea is that voltage division the idea of voltage division is that um, the voltage dropped in a resistance I is proportional to the resistance I itself in series. Okay, do another example. Okay, we look at these examples just so you don't have to um, it becomes intuitive for you to um, look at relationships rather than uh, getting lost in numbers. I don't like calculating numbers, okay? Let's say, and that's the reason why I like to use these weird numbers, 9.7568 volts, okay? There's no way you can uh, look at this and, and get intuition until you use some other, un unless you use some other technique. Let's use a resistance value of, I don't know, 13.965325 ohms, a very arbitrary number, okay? And what I'm going to do is to use the exact same value resistance here as well, okay? For ease, I'm going to just use 9 point, uh, 9 point, uh, 9.2 volts. Let's say I'm applying a voltage of 9.2 volts and I ask you to calculate V1, V2, okay? Now, what you have to do is you should not immediately whip out your calculator. Just look at these resistances, they're equal. When the resistances are equal, each resistance must be dropping or um, consuming equal voltage. So probably, and I'll not be right if I do this, V1 is 9 point, oops, 9.6 over 2, 9.2 over 6, sorry, 9.2 over 2, which is going to be 4.6 volts 
9.2 over 2, which is going to be 4.6 volts. So all I have done is half of 9.2. So let me write it this way. 9.2 is the total voltage applied. Half of that is dropping across V1 and half of that is dropping across R2. So this is R2, right? This is V2 and the voltage corresponding here is V1. Okay. So the idea being in voltage division, you can look at the relative values of the resistors and see um, and, and be able to make some predictions about, about uh, the voltages that they drop. Okay, let's do one more problem. Let me make some room here. Okay. Okay, let's do one more problem here. Let's pick some numbers. I don't know, 25 and uh, 50. Okay, 25 and 50. Then uh, let's say we pick a number that's uh, 100 volts that is applied. So these numbers are really weird. You don't apply such a, in general, in practice, in reality, you don't apply such a large voltage to such a small resistance at all, ever, okay? Because it's simply going to um, pass too much of current and burn up your, uh, and generate excessive amount of Okay, so let's see, without doing the math, would you be able to give me the value for V1 and V2? Twenty-five, seventy-five. Right, it's twenty-five volts and seventy-five volts. So the idea is the voltage drop V one is proportional to R one. This guy is proportional to R two. I pick these numbers because they're convenient. If I pick this fifty, the math would not be. The principle is still the same. The math would not be so convenient. Okay, the math would come out to be one hundred over 75 times 25. So it's going to come out to be 33.3 and 66.7. So one third, depending on, um, so the large voltage, 50 volts is going to drop 66.7%. And then this is going to drop 33%. So in some sense, that's the idea. Okay, so I pick these numbers because they're more convenient for me to, do mental math, okay? So that's the idea of voltage divider, okay? You can apply the formula here, R1. So in order to find V1, you can apply the formula here, R1, by R1 plus R2 into Vs, and you'll arrive at this result, okay? So that's exactly what I have done just that I have done them um, visually without putting that on paper. All right, um, let's move on to talking about current division, okay? Current division is also going to be very similar, okay? So when we talked about um, resistors in series, current is the same. So that's what we discussed so far, voltage division. Current is the same, the voltage is divided. Okay, the voltage is divided, the current is the same. Larger R drops larger V. Smaller R drops smaller V. That's the voltage division, and that happens in series. Right? So that's what we looked at. Let's see if we can look at current division. Okay, so we looked at these problems 100K, 25K, 100K, so on and so forth. 
Okay, so let's look at current division. Okay, earlier in voltage division or in series, the same current was flowing through all the resistors, but different voltage was dropped across different resistors. Okay, but that's different here. Okay, in current division, when you have resistances in parallel, the same voltage appears between all the resistors while the currents flowing through them are different. Okay, this is something we already looked at in the last class. Okay, so what you can do is in order to find I1, okay, when you have a, a bunch, a couple of resistors like this, okay, there is R1 flowing in, flowing south in the resistance R1, I2 flowing south in the resistance R2, okay? And then you know IS is I1 plus I2 by applying KCL, okay? By applying KCL at that node. The current coming in IS is equally, is divided between I1 and I2, so IS should sum to I1 and I2. That's the notion, that's the idea. Okay, let's see. How would you find the value for I1? Okay, how would you find the value for I1? Okay, the value for I1 is R2 times IS by R1 plus R2. Okay, so I1 is proportional to the other value, okay? Is proportional to the other resistance R2, okay? If you want to find out I2, okay, let's see if you want to find out I2, that will be R1 times IS by R1 plus R2, or I2 is proportional to R1, okay? R2 is proportional to R1. So that's exactly what we have here. Let's see. So I1 okay, I1 is R2 over R1 plus R2 well, on the other hand, I2 is R1 over R1 plus R2. R1 over R1 plus R2, R1 over R1 plus R2. Okay. Let's see. Now, this is I1 and I2, the idea of current division circuit. Okay, let's see. And then we looked at some problem. We had to first solve the parallel um, solution and then look at the total current and then apply voltage division circuit. Okay, so let's see. Let's go back to our uh, idea earlier. Let's add a page here and then see if we can get some intuitive understanding. Okay, let's say there is a current source, a current source that is supplying some current, and I don't care what value it is. Okay, let's say I have resistors R1 and R2. Okay, let's say I have a current that is supplying um, current source that is supplying IS, whose value is 10 amperes, okay? And these resistances are five ohms each, okay? Or it doesn't matter, let's say I make them 20 
R1 equals to, and uh, let's make R2, R1 equals to 10 to the power five ohms, okay? And R2 is 10 to the power five ohms, or 10 kilo ohms, okay? It's not, it's not um, unreasonable number. What would you think the current would be in each of these branches, I1 and I2? I don't have to do the math. These resistances are equal. So the current is going to split equally. The 10 amperes current is going to split equally between these two resistors, okay? So that's, that's simply in an application of, uh, Okay, so let me pick a different value for these resistors. Okay, let me pick a value of, uh, of a large one for R1. So let's pick eight kilo ohms. And let's pick a smaller value for this guy, two kilo ohms. Okay, then what you would see is I1 will be two amperes and I2 would be eight amperes. So the larger resistance is passing, is, is carrying a small current, while the smaller resistance is carrying a larger percentage of the current. Let me double check. I, using current division, right? I1 is R2, oops, R2 over, R1 plus R2 times Is, okay? So this is going to cancel. I1 is going to give me two amperes, okay? Now, that, that, that's, you know, we can extend this um, idea further and look at some weird numbers and then uh, numbers that uh, are not easy to calculate and still um, find a solution, okay? The point being, in current division, in current division, okay, I1 is proportional to R2, specific, uh, in relation to the above problem, okay? I2 is proportional to R1. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay. Questions, please. Okay. So that's the idea of current division and voltage division. Mm -hmm. Now, simple concepts, but if you think of them and understand them in intuitive terms, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to forget them, okay? Let's see if I can give you another tool, okay? So far, we looked at a bunch of different tools. So we looked at these different tools, passive sign convention, KCL, KVL, series paddle, current voltage division. When it came to KCL and KVL, the idea was to set up, okay? The idea was to set up a system of simultaneous linear equations, a system of simultaneous linear equations and solve them, okay? But as it turns out, as it turns out, not all equations are easy to solve by hand, okay? And as we go into chapter four, chapter five, and even chapter eight and nine, you will see that the equations that we use,
they're going to be they're going to be very very um, unwieldy. So you're going to look at equations that appear like this, that are unwieldy, that are that are unrelenting when you want to solve them using hand. Okay, there are two unknowns, v1 and v2. So you have two equations. So in principle, in theory, you could solve them using hand. You could, you know, manipulate this algebraically and arrive at a solution. Okay, but that's extremely increasingly difficult when you deal with the real circuits where the numbers are not very um, convenient. Okay, real numbers are not convenient. It's, it's impossible to tackle them. So we need to have a tool, a calculator tool, okay, that makes it easy for us. Okay, so the first thing we are going to look at, the first tool that we are going to look at is MATLAB. Okay, MATLAB can help you quite significantly increase the um, or re, re, increase the speed at which you solve, automatically solve. And think of this as a calculator that you can program. Okay, <clears throat> it's very easy, extremely easy, and I'm going to show you the three lines of code. Calling it line of calling calling it MATLAB code is also uh, disrespecting code um, it's not really code you just plug in three three lines of uh, matlab um, syntax and then it will spit out the solutions for you okay the idea is that it's a very handy tool when you are trying to solve problems of simultaneous linear equations okay we encounter this set of linear equations quite frequently when we were doing KCL, when we were doing KVL, okay? Let me go back. Since we have time, I can go back and repeat myself and, you know, spend as much time as it um, takes to drive home the point, okay? So if I, I'm looking for the generic process that I gave you when solving using KCL and KVL, Maybe I can look for it on here. On the... Somewhere in here, I gave you a generic process. Right here. Just one page about that. Okay. I gave you the general approach for solving KCL and KVL. Okay. Step one was to set up the directions for voltage and current. Step two was to identify the unknowns. Step three was to look at the number of nodes and set up KCL equations, okay? Apply KCL and set up equations. Okay? That's, that's, um, that's what we are interested in um, doing, okay? Step four also involves setting up KVL equations. So the point being, when you're looking at um, the KCL and KVL, you are setting uh, up a bunch of different equations, and then you have to solve those equations. If there are five unknowns, you need five equations. If there are three unknowns, you need three equations, okay? So often you'll find yourself having to solve a system of linear equations with two, three unknowns, three equations simultaneously, and that's where you're MATLAB comes in handy. Okay, let's see. So the solution to that set of linear equations is the independent variables that we are seeking and MATLAB is a very useful tool that can speed up this process. Okay, let me quickly show you. Fortunately, it's installed for you on Hydra. You don't have to install MATLAB on your laptop if you don't want to. But MATLAB is a very um, handy tool. It's a very convenient tool. And I strongly suggest that you try to download um, the student version of MATLAB that is available from Saxley. Okay. Our university provides a license to MATLAB that you can download on your 
system. So we encourage you to do that. If not, if you don't want to go through the hassle of um, installing MATLAB on your laptop, which is really worth it, um, I would say you can even access that on Hydra. It's a server on which uh, MATLAB is already installed for you. Okay, all you have to do is to um, follow these steps, open the mode desktop connection, enter hydra.ecs.edu, include your ECS credentials. So follow these steps, okay? Follow these steps and then, um, and then once you log into the remote desktop, okay, on Hydra server, you can pull up this MATLAB software. You can open that MATLAB software, okay, and start running this MATLAB for solving your equations. Okay, so here is Hydra. This is a screenshot of how it appears, the desktop appears for Hydra. And then um, that's where you would find MATLAB. You know, you'll, you'll find that MATLAB probably was updated um, to the recent version after this slide has been created. Okay. And it will still be there for you, uh, updated and fresh. Okay. Once you pull up MATLAB, there's a bunch of different panes. It's a complicated, compli complex tool that can um, solve a whole lot of different problems for you. And so all of this functionality is going to um, make it a bit cluttered and a bit intimidating if you don't follow step-by-step -step process. But don't worry too much about it. We start with the simple, simple pane here, and then um, include. I'll provide you the code as well. Okay, I'll provide you the simple MATLAB three lines of code that you can use. Okay, okay. I'll provide you the simple MATLAB three lines of code. Okay, it's this card. Okay, so if you were solving a different set of equations, you change these numbers, these numbers, but the rest is all going to be the same. The only thing that you need to change is this guy, change that, change this, but really the rest is going to be same. Let me show you how that is done, okay? Let's see, so once you pull up MATLAB, it can help you solve a system of linear equations. Let's say I have an equation, linear equation that appears like this. Okay, 29V1 minus V2 equals to 2880. Negative V1 plus 17V2 equals 240. Okay, you can choose to solve this by algebraic manipulation um, without using MATLAB. If you use MATLAB, it really is a very, very simple um, problem to solve. All you're doing is you're separating out the unknown variables. Okay, let's say the variables V1 and V2, right? These are the unknown variables. That you are expressing as a matrix, unknown variable matrix. Similarly, the coefficients coefficients that correspond to these variables. We're expressing that as a coefficient matrix, okay? There's a coefficient matrix over there. And then the constants, they're shown as one matrix, okay? So simply put, the system of linear equations are expressed as matrices, okay? And solving system of linear equations using matrices is not a new technique, okay? It has been fairly well developed. Okay, and there's a rich set of theory and, and techniques surrounding it, okay? And I'm sure you must have uh, seen this earlier in your math courses. But the idea is simple. You're, trying to set up the equation in such a manner that A times B oops, equals to C, okay? 
Well, C is the coefficients, okay? A, uh, C is the constants, I'm sorry. C is the constants, A is the coefficients. See, they're color-coded. A is the coefficients, B is the unknown variables, and C is the constant values that you have, okay? Once you have this, you should be able to calculate. So you know all the, all the elements of the matrix A, you know all the elements of matrix C, you don't know any element of the matrix B. So it comes down to um, manipulating this guy. If you want to find out B, all you have to do is calculate inverse of A and multiply that by C. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, MATLAB can very, very easily do that for you. Calculating of calculation of inverse, okay, and multiplication on uh, matrices. Okay, MATLAB is a very efficient tool to do this matrix multiplication. Okay. So when you want to solve a system of linear equations, all you have to do is to simply apply. So there is 29, negative one, corresponding to the first row, negative one, 17, corresponding to the second row of the coefficient matrix A. So this guy is B, this guy is C, okay, and this guy is A. Okay, there are two rows in A, they are shown using the two rows in here, okay? So that's all there is to it. If you want to write the equation for a different set of, set up the equation, set up the solution for a different set of equations, you simply have to change the values here, okay? You don't even have to touch this guy. You just have to change the values in the matrices and then MATLAB is going to spit out the values for B, okay? So that's all there is to that, using MATLAB to solve system of linear equations, okay? And then MATLAB will give you solutions that correspond to your unknowns, okay? So V1 equals to 100 volts, V2 equals to 20 volts, okay? And I tell you what, I strongly encourage you to look at this MATLAB solution right away and see if you can repeat some of the example problems or solve um, some equations of your own, okay? Because come time for the second exam, okay? The equations are going to be much more complicated than we have seen and you'll find yourself dearly wishing that you practice on MATLAB before, just so, um, you are allowed to use the MATLAB on exam, right? So why not, why not get some practice on it for exam two, okay? All right, so when we come back you know, at a later time, I'm going to show you how MATLAB can even solve, okay? MATLAB can even solve complex number equations, equations that involve complex or imaginary numbers, okay? This 10 plus J1, 3 plus J1, these are imaginary numbers or complex numbers that we will look at in chapters eight, nine, okay? In, chapter, in further um, chapters, okay? In this course. So the general process is still going to be the same. You'll still apply, you'll still um, divide the equation into your coefficients into your unknowns and then into your constants. The general process is still the same, okay? Just that the coefficient matrix, that's the only thing that's different. Instead of having purely real coefficients, the equations have complex number coefficients. Nothing else changed, okay? We'll come back to look at this later on. Okay, so even then, even in that case, see the equation didn't change, the solution didn't change, the code didn't change, all that changed was that uh, the matrix values have to be replaced, 
Okay, everything else is exactly the same. Questions? Um, I have a Questions. question. Yes. Uh, what we're looking at right now, where okay. can we access that online? Good question. Let's see. Give me a second for, uh, yeah, it's uploaded now. It's uploaded to Google Drive. Oh, okay. Okay, you, you, you do know the link to the Google Drive that um, has all the class annotations, correct? Yes, I think you showed us that. It's on Moodle at the very top page. Yes, ma'am. That's exactly where you'll find this guy. Other questions, please? Okay. All right, let's see. We'll stop here. I don't want to overextend myself for today, um, we can look at chapter four, which includes nodal analysis, um, node voltage method and mesh current method. But I would say, um, get some practice on chapters one, two, and three, okay? And then tomorrow, I introduce, um, introduce chapter four, okay? So, um, Let's see, did I cover everything that I wanted to cover in this? Okay, yeah, so that, that's about it. Um, if you don't have further questions, I'll see you folks tomorrow.